This is a molecule of CO2, carbon dioxide. Did you know that the average American emits 120 pounds of CO2 every year? This fill, filled with CO2, weighs one pound. Every day, we release 120 spheres like this in the atmosphere. Last year, we humans emitted 40 billion metric tons of CO2, the volume of which is enough to fill 8 billion Olympic-sized swimming pool. I'm going to talk to you about three things. First, how bad it really is with the climate crisis. Then, why haven't we fixed it? And lastly, what I think is the number one method for change. We are going to turn you into climate optimists. When I was 16 years old, I wanted to become a journalist. I read different newspapers every day, and in December 1997, something special happened. For the first time, and for several days in a row, climate change, or the greenhouse effect, as we said then, made the front cover in different newspapers. I remember this was a very, very stressful period in my life. I had the feeling that we were on a spaceship that was going to hit a wall and that nobody cared. Basically, I had a choice to make. Either I was going to process the information and make something with it, or I would just pretend I never heard it and keep with my normal existence. I decided to embrace climate action. The journey was not easy. There were many pushbacks. But it helped me understand why we are so bad at tackling the issue and how we can solve it. The first time anyone understood about the effect of carbon dioxide to global temperature was in 1896, 122 years ago. Swedish scientist Svante Arrhenius realized that if our CO2 concentration doubled, temperature would increase significantly. This terrifying discovery remained largely unknown for the next 75 years until it was finally discussed at a UN conference in 1972. And then, it took another 20 years for climate change to finally make it to the mainstream media when the first climate treaty was adopted in 1992. What happened since then? Honestly, before I prepared this talk, I knew that CO2 concentration had kept increasing, but I didn't know the scale of it. Our cumulative CO2 emissions doubled. The amount of CO2 that we release in the atmosphere since 1992 is equivalent to the amount of CO2 that we humans burn between the beginning of the Industrial Revolution and 1992. The area in gray on this chart is the same than the area in red. The aim of the Paris Agreement is to prevent global temperature to increase by more than 2 degrees Celsius or 3.6 degrees Fahrenheit. It has been developed with the latest science and climate models tell us that we have less than 20 years of emission at the current level before we get catastrophic change. In fact, we need to cut our CO2 emissions by 50% by 2050, and we need to go CO2 or carbon neutral before the end of this century. For the number of us out there, I want to show you our carbon budget. That's the amount of CO2 that we can release and which is compatible with the aim of the Paris Agreement. Basically, we can release 2,900 billion metric tons of CO2. We have already consumed 2,100 billion. So we only have 800 billion, with a B, tons of CO2 left. And if we look at the business as usual emissions, which include the commitments that countries made in Paris, we would exceed this figure by more than a thousand billion metric tons of CO2, which would lead us to catastrophic change and temperature increase of more than four degrees Celsius. The cause of the issue is well understood. The, the burning of fossil fuel, coal, gas, oil, in order to generate electricity represents 25% of the problem. Then we have agriculture and land use, mostly deforestation, which represents another 24%. Energy use and processes in the industry is responsible for 21%. And then we have other types of energy use, of course, for transportation and in buildings. 
That's the cause of the issue. The consequences are also well documented. We know that poles are melting at an alarming rate. Oceans are becoming warmer, and warmer oceans means more intense and more frequent hurricanes. Last year, in the US and Caribbean alone, hurricanes claimed hundreds of lives and destroyed for more than 300 billion US dollars of assets. Some projections by the UN estimate that by 2050, there will be more than 1 billion climate refugees. We know that there will be more famines and there will be new type of diseases in a warmer climate. So if we have known about the role of CO2 in global temperature since 1896, why haven't we fixed it? In my career, I found three main types of pushback. First, there are the climate deniers or climate skeptics. They don't want to trust the science. It's snowing in New York in April. How can you tell me that temperatures are rising? Arguing with people who don't want to trust scientific evidence is not easy. But I must say that this category is losing momentum, especially in the business community. Then, the second argument that I hear a lot is from people who agree that climate change is a big issue, but they think that there are other issues that are more important to tackle, or that it's just too expensive to tackle. And I am trained as an economist myself, so I understand the concept of prioritization. Every dollar that we invest in renewable energy does not necessarily help the most vulnerable people. So it can create doubt about whether we should invest all our energy into solving this issue. I must say that this category is also losing momentum, mostly for two reasons. First, the reason why so many countries and people are investing in climate action is that most of these actions also contribute to the improvement of global health. We see that when China invests in renewables, it's to protect the health of its citizens. That becomes the main driver. Some people might not care about the level of CO2 in 10 or 20 years, but they see the effect of the burning of coal, oil, and gas on their children's health today. And then the second reason is that the prices are decreasing. The price of solar and wind energy half over the last 10 years. Today in the US, the cheapest way to generate electricity is with wind energy. So what is missing? I think the number one method for change is measurement. The day that we start measuring carbon emission is the day that we make positive change possible. In all areas of life, when we want to make a change, we start with measurement. We can only manage what we measure. If we want to lose weight, we look at the calories we eat in, and we look at the calories we burn when we exercise, and we look at the effect on the scale. If we want to improve our athletic performance, we set a goal, we train, and we look with a timer how we do compared to the objective. That's the same with climate action. When we calculate and put a price on CO2, it's called carbon accounting. Carbon accounting is the art of calculating CO2 and putting a price on carbon or CO2. At my company, CO2 Logic, we have been using carbon accounting for the last 10 years with more than 200 organizations. We helped them save more than half a million metric tons of CO2, saving millions in energy costs, and reinvesting some of this saving into the development of additional carbon reduction projects in some of the countries that are the most affected by the climate crisis saving another half a million metric tons of CO2. Let me give you three examples of how effective carbon accounting can be. First, take Proximus. Proximus is the largest telecommunication company in Belgium. In 2007, they decided to start calculating the carbon emission. And they set a very ambitious goal, reducing the carbon footprint by 70%, 70, by 2020. The CCU became rapidly involved and they achieved the target five years in advance in 2015. Then in 2016, they decided to become even better by offsetting the carbon emission by giving back to 35 climate projects. The picture that you see there 
is one of the projects which is supported by Proximus. It's in Benin, and we provide efficient cook stoves in order to avoid deforestation and to improve local health. By doing so, we help achieve 10 of the sustainable development goals. And one of the really cool things about this project is that we can capture the excess heat from the stove in order to charge mobile phones, further reducing carbon emissions. My second example is in the financial industry. That's a project I did, and you see a picture of the team here. That's a project we did a couple of years ago with the European Investment Bank, the largest multilateral bank in the world. Basically, the bank asked us to help them understand the carbon footprint of their project because they wanted to use the cost of carbon to society, the social cost of carbon, in their cost-benefit analysis. So we look at the projects that the bank finance, and we develop methodologies to calculate the carbon emissions of new airports, train stations, highways. And with these methodologies, we were able to capture the carbon footprint, apply the social cost of carbon, and put this in the cost from the cost-benefit analysis. Any time a project would emit too much CO2, the cost would be too high, sometimes exceeding the benefit, and the bank would not finance the project. So that would mean that either the project would be modified in order to reduce the carbon footprint, or it would simply not be financed. The last example I want to show you is what happens if we don't use carbon accounting. I want to talk to you about the green bond markets. Green bonds are bonds that are used in order to finance projects with some environmental benefits. This market is booming. Some estimates show that it should get one trillion US dollar by 2020. This is great, and this could really help us achieve the goal of the Paris Agreement. But are they really green? My analysis, based on carbon accounting, showed me that some of the projects that were financed through green bonds were more of a marketing uh, stunt and a PR relationship exercise, and some of these projects are actually adding billions of pounds of CO2 in the atmosphere. We see projects that are being developed by governments with really poor track record when it comes to climate action. So we see that carbon accounting not only help us make the right choice, it can also stop us from making damaging ones. We have application of carbon accounting in different areas. We can use it in order to develop voluntary offsets to implement carbon fees or carbon markets, or even to develop carbon labeling system so that consumers can understand what's the carbon footprint of the products that they purchase. Is it too late? Do we still have a chance to succeed? The answer is yes, we can. But it's going to be all together. The data that I'm going to show you comes from Project Drawdown. Basically, what they did was looking at technologies that exist today and that could help us avoid the 1,000 billion metric tons of CO2 that I mentioned. You remember the gap between our business as usual emission and where we should be in order to meet the goal of the Paris Agreement. And we see that we have these solutions. Wind and solar energy can help us achieve 18% of the objective. And then best practices in agriculture we could also save more than 120 billion metric tons of CO2 with better practices in agriculture. Education and family support. We know that when people get access to education, they tend to have kids later in life and less kids, which, of course, reduce the pressure we have on the environment. Refrigerant management. We use gases in our cooling systems that are damaging the climate. If we can make sure that these gases are not released in the atmosphere, we can save almost 100 billion metric tons of CO2. And of course, we need to protect the forest. We should stop damaging forests. And we should reduce food waste, especially here in the US. Eating a plant-rich diet is also one way to reduce uh, our carbon footprint significantly. And there are other things we can do. Of course, geothermal, efficient cook stoves, electric vehicles, all these things are going to help but, and, and if we implement all of them, we will avoid the 1,000 billion metric tons of CO2. Before to conclude, I want to think about our own impact. 
and how we can influence others. There are things that we can do better, there are smarter choices that we can make, and that can have a big impact. For instance, if you go to the restaurant and order a mushroom burger instead of a beef burger, that's almost 10 pounds of CO2. Remember, 10 things like this that you can prevent from being released in the atmosphere. If you switch from a regular electricity contract to a renewable electricity contract, your household is going on average to save 12 pounds of CO2 every day. And if you cycle to work instead of driving, for every mile that you cycle, it's almost one pound of CO2 that you are going to save. And when you buy stuff, think second hand. If you buy a second hand shirt or t-shirt, it's almost 20 pounds of CO2 that you can prevent. Of course, it's not just about individual action. We need to work on this together. So we need to convince our elected representative, our businesses, our clients, our suppliers, we need to convince everyone to start calculating, understanding the carbon footprint, setting a target, and reduce it. I know this was a lot of data to digest, and I know some of them were scary, but I hope that you are ready to join me and become a climate optimist. Thank you.